Welcome to today's class. We'll be going through the 2021 past paper for Informatics 1B. So let's get started. So with with recursion, right? Remember, recursion is basically when a function calls itself, right? That's recursion. So recursion is when the function calls itself. So with recursion, we could, um, so there's two types of ways, right? There's, this, there's, there's the iterative way, there's the approach of solving a problem called the iterative method or iterative way, where you use loops, right? Where there's any loop, we call that an iterative approach or iterative method. And then where, when you talk about recursive method, this is where you use functions to solve that problem. So we can be, what I'm saying is that we can basically make a loop using a function. And when we do that, we call that recursion. It's called recursion. And in order to achieve that, we need to call the function itself. We need to call, uh, the function needs to call itself. So within that function, you need to call that function again. So I can make a simple example before I start doing the paper. So you can have, let's say, for example, I have a loop, right, for I as, so let me change the language to Visual Basic. So I can say for I as integer is equals to one to 10, right? Something like that. And then end for, or end I, uh, next I, what am I saying? Uh, going to be next I been working with a lot of programming languages lately so it's for I is integers equals to 1 to 10 then maybe I just want to calculate a sum right so let me say dim sum as integer is equals to 0 right and then I'm going to say sum plus or equals I which basically means this basically means sum is equals to sum plus i. So take the current value of sum, which is going to start at zero, obviously, and then add the current value inside i, which is going to start at one. And then eventually it's going to get to 10. So basically I'm adding the numbers from one to 10. And then the equivalent of this, right? The equivalent of this in using a function or using recursion, right? So this would be recursion. And then this would be iterative, right? Um, yeah, let me just save it like that. And then iterative. And then we can, recursion part, we can create the function. So I'm going to say private function, um, calc sum. I'm just call it calc sum, right? It takes, it takes, let's say it takes n as integer, which is the the maximum like stopping point, which is going to be 10, obviously. And then it's going to return an integer. And then I'm going to end my function there. So with the recursion, right, we always have two cases. We have the base case, which basically means that when should the recursion stop? So when when should the remember this function will keep calling itself. So if you, in order to stop that to keep so that you, in order to stop it from calling itself infinite number of times, you would have to create what we call a base case, which is like a condition that says when to stop. Just like this, you see, I'm saying from one two. This is two ten, so it stops at ten. Imagine if I didn't have this and it went to infinite it would be a problem. So I need a stopping point, obviously. So that's what we call the base case. Then we have the recursive case. Basically, the, the case when the function keeps calling itself. 
and we can call you can call the function remember remember what happens here let me show you something okay i think this should be yeah i, I don't think we need this parameter we honestly don't so remember the recursive cases we need to keep we need to keep calling the function right because we need to calculate the sum and remember the sum we need to move to the next value so if you're starting at one we need to go to two and then three and then four eventually until we get to ten so with the recursive case right so i'm just going to put the recursive case here and just say it should return so what should it return remember i want to calculate the sum so okay this is i haven't done this thing in a while <laughs> hopefully i can still remember so i'm gonna call the function let me think so i need to call how can i you see now it's been it's been a while it's been a while I know the base case. I know every, everything. I know how to stop. How to stop everything. Now the tricky part is this. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. I, I see. I see what formula to how to calculate that. So this function, I'll just call it sum. Right. Let me just call it sum to keep it short. It can take a parameter, right? But then this parameter, right? N, in my case n will act n will be will act as as the starting point in my case i could do it vice versa do i do what do i mean by starting point and what do i mean by i could do it vice versa so remember t functions you typically take in the the big number for example 10 which is a stopping point i could do, do it like that because remember Remember what, what I'm trying to say. You could start counting from one and say one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven plus eight plus nine plus ten. Remember things like addition are commutative. We're going back to maths. Commutative, if I'm not mistaken. Is it is it associated? I think it's commutative that's the right term so basically it doesn't matter in what order i add the numbers i could start from 10 and say 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. it doesn't matter in what order i add them so to show this let me just open visual studio to make it simple because I'm going to show you two 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 ways. The first method is when we take in one, which is the actual starting point. The second method is when you st take the stopping point. Obviously, the formula is going to change. If I take one, remember, I need to increase, increase by one to get the next term. Increase by one to keep getting the next term. You always increase by one. If I take in the stopping point, I need to de de decrement or decrease by one. Decrease by one, decrease by one, decrease by one. So that's pretty much what you need to do. So let me create the project. Mm. Visual Basic, next. Let me close this. Mm. So this would be us testing out recursion. Recursion and iteration right to iterative approach and then i'll just place it on the desktop and then create yeah it's been a while but then i i and I, I know how recursion works or so did i just it, it had been a very long time since i did this the thing is i'm not gonna have enough time to demonstrate the steps all the steps in recursion right I uh, don't have that time. I don't want to make the video too long. But there is, there is, there is, if you remember the diagram that you have on your slides, whereby they show you like how the recursion works, how do we get to the uh, final answer? 
there is something like that in your slides. And then this will be the button. I wouldn't have time to be renaming things and doing all of that. That's too much work. And I won't put options strict on whatever. I don't have that's not the main point for doing this. So I'm gonna say dim um sum as integer. Integer is equals to zero. And then I'm gonna do my for loop for i as integer is equals to one, two, ten. Remember by default the step is one. Basically it increases by one. By default, that's the step. So I don't need to put step then specify what steps it should take. And then I'm gonna say sum plus equals i, basically adding from one to ten. Simple, right? And then I'm gonna use a message box to output the sum. And then I'm gonna this is the iterative approach, right? So if I click this, I get 55, right? So that's the answer that I'm expecting. If I use a function or a recursive function, this would be iterative. And then I'm going to have recursive. Remember, I need to create the function before I can call it. So this would be recursive. So let's create one. You see, it, the starting point is one. So when I call this function, I'm going to pass in one. See, that's the starting point. So private function calc sum and then n as integer and it returns an integer as integer. So remember we need to have the base case basically when should the recursion stop and then we need to have a recursive case where the function would keep getting called. Basically where the function calls itself. But remember every time we call the function Every time we call back the function, it needs to come up. We need to update this value. So imagine n in this case acts as like it's i. So we need to update i. So the recursive case, right? I'll just do an if statement there for recursive case. So when should it stop? When n, um, I should say when n is, is greater, let me say greater than 10. Because if I say when n is equals to 10, that means, um, Okay, I think I could say it's equals to 10. We'll see. I'll just say if it's greater than 10, right? When now n is greater than 10, then stop. So when it's now greater than 10, what should it return? It should return 10. Basically, when it becomes greater, it goes above 10, it should return 10, right? Because I want it to stop at 10. So it should return 10. And then once it returns 10, then it's going to go back into that diagram which of which I don't have time to make now and substitute all the different values. So I'm going to say it should return that function. I call the function back again, right? And then I pass n. But then remember this n, it's like it's going to be starting point, which is i. So I need to increase it by one every time I call it. So I need to increase it by one. And then I also need to add back n because I'm trying to find the sum, right? Remember what's go what's going to happen here. It's quite it's quite a long process, and I know you guys are not fond of watching long videos, so that's why I'm not gonna go into that, explaining how this works in terms of the diagram. But then I think I did make a video if I'm not mistaken. So we you have the calc sum, right? So it's gonna start at calc sum one right it's gonna set it it's gonna set it one right remember i'm gonna pass one that's the starting point so calc sum two it means call the call that calc sum function with the with the value two inside and then um add one so which is basically technically it's basically saying two plus one and then in the next step i'm gonna call that cal that calc sum has been called right and you passed in the value two but then in the next step calc sum it will be now two plus one, which is going to be three, plus the current n. The current n is two, so it's going to be plus two. And then it's going to keep doing that and doing that until eventually we get to ten, right? So remember, we're going to get to it will allow it will 
10 will go through, right? When when is 10 will be able to call that function in recursive. But then when we call it again, and, uh, and n now is now greater than 10, then it's going to stop. It's going to just return 10. So basically when you get to calc um, sum, I think it's going to have 11 here and 11 there. It should just return 10. Or you could say when it's equals, when n is equals to 10, just return 10. So yeah, there's many ways you can go about doing it. So let's just double check and see if it actually runs. So let me just call calc sum here. So I'm going to dim, declare a variable, call it answer as integer is equals to calc sum. And then I'm going to pass one inside that calc sum, which is going to act like the starting point. Might output the wrong answer. We just need to make sure the base case, right? The stopping point is correct. So let's just test. So 55, 65, right? So something is, is wrong. Like I said, it might be wrong. So I think what we should do, is not, we shouldn't say when it's greater than 10. We should say when it gets to 10, just stop. It stops there, right? When I get to 10, remember it's going to count, right? It's going to start at 1 n becomes 2, n becomes 3, n becomes 4, n becomes 5, and so forth. So when you get to 10, we should stop the day. So you should stop when you get to 10. So hopefully it's going to be correct now. So let's see, 55, 55, perfect. So that's pretty much how you can convert this to recursion. Right? I did, if I'm not mistaken, I think I did make a video on this. Something tells me that I did make a video, especially drawing the diagram. I think I did explain it extensively. So that was, that was the first approach, right? Remember, it's commutative. You can add in whatever order. I could technically start from the end. So let's do that and show you that it actually does work. I would pass in 10, but then my formula needs to change. Now I need to stop when I get to 1. Because remember, I'm counting from that side from 10, and then I need to stop when I get to 1. And then that means this should now, when it get, when, it's, when n is now 1, just return the answer 1. But then now, instead of saying n plus 1, I'm going to subtract. Because if I'm starting at 10, I need to call the calc sum with the next term, which is 10 minus 1, which is 9. And then when I'm at 9, when n is 9, I need to call the calc sum function with the next term, which is 9 minus 1, which is 8, which is basically this. I start at 10, I subtract 1, I call the function, but, but then n is reduced by 1. So therefore, I call calc sum with the input, with the integer 9. And then I call calc sum with the in, 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 input of 9 minus 1, which is 8, the next 10, and so forth and so forth. So this should be correct. I just changed a few things. So 55, 55, still the same answer. So there's many ways you can go about doing this. So this is just an example of doing that. So I'll just close this. And then, yeah, I'll just make sure I send you this, all of these things. So let's start, right? Let's start, how do we do this thing? So the way we do this is, you see the, the base case is this. That means when a is now less than or equals to one, that's when we stop we, and the answer should be zero. So the way I was taught by Prof. Lee Jung was a very good, great lecture. She taught us this way, you make a table. You're gonna make a table. So I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna make a table. This would be question one. Right. And then da, 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 da. so this would be question one. So question one, I need to make a table. So the table is gonna be you see the table, right? You put in all your parameters first. 
So it's A, B, C, right? So that I can keep track of what is the current value of A and B and C while when I'm doing this recursion. So if I go back here, I'm going to have a, the A column and the B column and the C column and the and the result, right? What is the result? It's the result of calling this. So I need to copy this. Mm, yeah, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think this is fine. And then there we go. I should normalize having, what is this? Having Microsoft Word, but then just that it consumes a lot of space. I think that I don't like that. So there we go. So since the recursive case says that when A is less than or equals to one, basically when it's equals to one, yeah, because the first, the first statement that will be true is when it's equals to one. So it's technically saying when A is equals to one, stop. So if A is equals to one, that means, it even told you, that means the calc2 function, will, it's a, the value of A will always be greater than one. We'll start at least with a value greater than one. So our main goal here, we are trying to find a pattern. That's our main goal. So we need to, to give A a starting point or starting value that's a bit bigger so that we take time to reach our base case and find the pattern. So it's like you're doing maths here. It's like you're finding a general term for the sequence, for the series. That's basically what you're doing here. So I'm going to start A at six. Let's just start stage six, right? right? Let's be generous. And then remember the only value that's changing here is a. Remember when you call the function again, we subtract. Oh no, the subtracting two. That, that yeah. We need an even number, right? So you see that we're subtracting two. Oh, so that means yeah. Okay, now I see. So that means now I see why they say less than or create, less than or equals to one. That means okay, it's up to you. You can start at an odd number or an even number. It's up to you. Yeah, it's not mandatory i was just seeing the two then i was like oh okay technically i can start with the odd number with an even number but then let's just show you that you don't need to start with an even number so let's just use um let me choose a random number let me say seven so seven minus two is five five minus two is three three minus two is one so it's going to be like four steps so let me make it let me actually make it Ill should I use nine or eleven? Because I want to have multiple steps so that I can see the general formula. So let me see. If I use ten, that's going to be ten, eight, um, ten, eight, six, four, two, zero. So I could use ten, but then if I use ten, just know that my numbers are gonna be even, right? A, A is going to be even basically because if I keep if I subtract two an even number from an even number I'm going to get back an even number. Remember that's not it's not mandatory for you to do it that way. You you choose any number, but then the main point is to have at least four steps, four four or more steps so that you can see the pattern. We need the general term for this. So B will remain as B, and then C will remain as C, and then the answer here would be. C times B. So I'm just going to write it in like this. That doesn't become too full. Question two, what is A minus two? A is currently 10 and I want to subtract two. So that means this would be eight. And then this would be B and then C. That means in the next step, I'm calling this function when a is now two. When when a is now less less than two, that's the next step. Meaning that a is, will be now eight. Make sure that the value that you have here it matches with the next term, with the next with the next uh, row. Because the next row just means I'm calling this method with that parameter when a is eight, when b is still b, when c is still c, and you'll see it right now. It's b, it's c. You see, eight is still eight, B is still B, and C is still C. So I'm on the right track. And then I'm gonna say C times B because the C, C and B don't change, right? They're still the same. Times calc question two. 
a is currently 8, so 8 minus 2 will just be 6. Like I said, since I chose 10, an even number, I'm going to have even numbers or even values of a. And then this would be, I hope I can still remember how to find the general formula. I still remember how to construct the table, but then I'll see how to find the pattern. So B remains as B, C remains as C, and then C times B, and then times calc, equation two, um, six minus two, because the formula is the current value of A subtract two. The current value of A is six, subtract two, we should give six minus two should give us four, and then B, C. Technically, I think you can kind of see the pattern, but we'll we'll see, we'll see when you get to, to when you get. And remember, when you're doing these steps, right, you're always checking A. My A is currently still le, still greater than one. The moment it's le, it's, me, it's immediately less than or equals to one. Yeah, the moment it's immediately less than or equals to one, then I should answer. Remember, when when I write this, this is the answer. That's what it means. That's why I wrote the, 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 the recursive formula at the top to say that this is the answer when I substitute my values into this formula. This would be the answer that I get. The, remember the, the base case, what I said, is to avoid you count, counting until infinite. Because if I don't put a stopping point, that means I'll keep subtracting 2 from A infinite times. It will never stop. I'll keep subtracting minus 2, minus 2, minus 2. I need to stop eventually. So this will be 4 and then C times B times calc equation 2. And then 4, A is currently 4 minus 2, subtract 4, 2 from A, which is just going, just going to be 4 minus 2, which is just 2. And then B and then C. And then the next, now remember this value is always match with the next term or next row. So 2, B, you see that B and C don't change. So in a general formula, we should take into account that B and C and B and C don't change. When you find the general term or the general formula, two minus two is zero, right? Two minus two is zero, and then B, C. So in the next step, A is zero, B is C, right? Now I can. Remember, every, on every step, I was checking the value of A if it's less than or equals to 1. And it was false every time. Now I got to 0. It is less than or equals to 1. So as you can see, there's the recursive, the base case. If A is less than or equals to 1, it's, it, it, it can, it, remember, when, I, when it says less than or equal to 1, remember what this means, less than or equals to. In English, it translates to less than or remember logic or equal to so that means one of these conditions need to hold true so it, it can either be less than or it can be it can either be equal to so just keep track of that so the answer for this function call should be zero because they told me here when a gets to that point the actual answer for that code should be zero. And then since that's the case, now I, I can back substitute. Because I have, when the function has these parameters, this is the answer. So I'm going to substitute here and say this should be times zero. And then when I have these parameters, when the function has these parameters, which means basically this part, this is the answer so i'm gonna copy this and then back substitute it here paste and then when the function is called with these parameters for b and c this is the answer so this function when it this is where we call the function of those parameters for b and c as you can see no pun intended and then i'm gonna replace that with the actual answer so basically just back substitute that's pretty much this the whole point of this when you call the the calc q2 uh, function with these parameters a is 6 b is b c c this is this will be the answer so where did we call it there it is calc q2 6 b and c paste there i can 
some you can someone see the pattern right and then 10 uh, when when the pattern when a is called when the function is called with a being 8 and b being b and then c being c then the answer would be this right and then now we can sort of like find a general term because this way we call the function with with a being 8 b being b and then c being c so that that's the answer so now what we need to do right I need to look at what is what was my I need to write it down and say what was my what was my what was my answer look at what's going on here we need to find a general formula look at it it's two and I had one of these and then it became four and I had two of these so we need to look you see that this this answer is affected by the current value of a so that means it's it's with respect to a so I, i'm going to make another table at the bottom to sh sort of like help me see that so when a so i need to see so i'm going to start at the bottom so the way i'm going to draw this diagram i'll start at the bottom going upward so when a is two what was the answer so i'll just do this and see what was the answer so it's just basically maths here they're seeing if you can like you can find general terms when a was when a was four remember it's only for in my example that's why i'm i'm saying it, it would differ for you you might you may you may have chosen a an odd number to start counting from I mean this is what i have this is the table that i have and then when a is eight that was the answer when a is eight this was the full answer don't forget the times zero at the end we're going to need that in our general term and then when a was 10 what was the answer it was this copy so we could we could find this in terms with remember we we tried to we see we've seen that these formulas are affected by the change in a so that means they are in respect to a so if you look at this isn't this like isn't this like um c would you say that this is say the same as c times b to the power of one times zero you'd say that right and then wouldn't you say this is c times b to the power of two right times zero i hope i can see the pattern here because i think i'm, I'm kind of struggling to see it but then we'll see so c times b how many how many c times b's do i have i have three of them so it's to the power three to the power three. Oh yeah i see the formula now times zero so yeah you see you need to do all of the steps and then the next step i have c times b how many do i have of those the c times b i have one two three four i have four of them to the power of four times zero and then the last one is you have c times b to the power of five times zero so this is pretty much the formula right so now i'm going to take these answers and try to phrase it in terms of a with respect to a look at what's changing is the one the two the three the four so basically what the way I would like to view it, you look at the va the variable that was changing that resulted in this change. You see that two was a was two and then now it suddenly became one. A was four. Now it suddenly became two. A was six. Now it suddenly became three. So we can see a pattern here. That means we take the current value of a and divide it by two. Then that answer that we get, we use that as the exponent to find how many c times b times b's that we get so i could also put in the next step you don't have to do this i'm just doing this to help you see the pattern if you are that like if you are that blind in terms of seeing the pattern so i'm gonna only focus on this right these answers that i got but then i'm gonna still have the table so a was that 
And then the answer would be this. So when A is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So it was this. Don't forget the time zero. It's always there. Even in, in your final answer, in the general term, it should be it should be there, the time zero. If you forget the time zero, you lose marks. And then this was to the power of two. How can, how can I see? Because I already see the general term. You take the current value of eight divided by two. That's how you find the exponent. So this is three, eight divided by two is four, 10 divided by two is five. So therefore, the general, the general term or the general formula is this, and the exponent is the current value of A divided by two. So this would be the final answer. I know it's a bit too much, it's like a lot. I, I just did it to see the pattern. You see, if you don't do all of, all of it this way, you won't see the pattern. So now I saw the pattern and this is the answer. So this is for question one, right? That was question one. Yeah, that's question one. So I need, I need to freeze where question one ends. So I'm going to do this. So that when you're looking at this, um, question one, come on, question one ends here. Yeah, I need to. The thing is, hey, with my laptop, I know it's going to give me problems if I start installing many things. So, yeah. Hopefully, I'll get a new laptop. Hopefully. Okay, so question two. I remember, you can just use Notepad plus plus, right? right? This is a VB. Um, this is a VB file that I've created. Basically, it's in Visual Basic. Or you can use text, text, a text, any notepad to just view the text. So we are done with question one. That's the formula that, or that's the result that you should have gotten there. So let's look at the programming. So that's three, five marks. It's quite a, it's quite a lot of steps involved, but then you should be able to do that quickly since practice the main point is or the, the main point that, that I'm trying to make is that you should practice because you see this five marks and there's quite a, a lot of steps involved you don't remember you don't have to do this some people they just they can just pick it up there yeah, that's smart they can just pick it up from this you could just also continue from there right remember I'm not saying you should have all of these steps you could just continue from there so this would be, remember this answer would be C times B to the power of five. And then you could do that to the power of, um, this is eight to the power of four and so forth. You could just do that. That's up to you. If, you're, if you don't want many steps, I suggest you do it that way so that you don't have many steps. Because me, I just phrase in this way so that I can see, see better. So question two, let's see question two. Uh, okay, we have 2.1. At least this one has, it's numbered, right? The questions are numbered. 2.1, so you're given a class. We have a pet shop, right? Which is a shop with pets or, or you can buy pet stuff. It's a, it's, it depends. So in this case, this pet shop has animals. So they are, they are animals, so we can, Buy, you can buy an animal. And then there's the contact number for that pet shop, and that pet shop has a name. And then this pet shop, the, then we have the animal class, whereby there's the diet type. So using what is already defined and declared, right? You need to learn to understand the question. Don't be spiritual and put your own things there. Using what is already defined and declared, write the necessary visual basic code. So they want visual. You see, be careful when you're reading things. Don't start writing UML here. Visual basic code, not UML or not design. Declare an integer variable called underscore age, which must be directly accessible by classes within 
animal hierarchy. So remember, we have things called access modifiers. Modifiers, right? So I'll just remove this. I'll answer in the next part, right? I need to explain the access modifiers. So the access modifiers that we have, we have private, meaning that only you have access to, to that, access to it. I could make an example, but then hey, my example are so, they're just so unhinged. So <laughs> I'll not make that example to explain the private, but then I'll, I'll use a different example. Then we have public. It means that the, the keyword is public. It means that the public or everyone has access to it. Meaning that it's like free for all. Like Oprah Winfrey usually says, you 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 get a jacket. Me just say it's a jacket. You get a jacket. You get a jacket. You get a jacket. Everyone gets a jacket. So it's like it's public. Everyone has access to it. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be special, right? The other ones, private and protected, you have to be special. And then we have protected. So protected, it's like the way I view protected, right? It's like a family secret. This is like a family secret recipe, right? Meaning that the descendants, uh, the yeah, descendants, the descendants or the children or the derived classes in terms of OOP terminology, the descendants or the children have access to it. And then since they have access to it, it will be public for them, but then yeah, have access to it, right? Let me phrase it that way. And then let me explain a bit further. That means it's public to children of this base class, right? That's what it means. It is public to them, but then private to people who are not the children. So that's protect protected. It's like a family secret recipe, right? They say your granny knows how to make the best chicken in the whole world. And people always compliment. They're like, give us the recipe, give us the recipe. Granny will not give anyone the recipe except for family members. Maybe when she's on a deathbed, then she's like, okay, I kept the recipe. I wrote the recipe on a piece of paper inside this drawer, inside that room and whatever. It's like it's hidden, right? But then descendants or, 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 or of her or hey grandchildren remember even though it's grandchildren they they're still you they're still her children too so it's she's going to pass down that family secret recipe to one of the children and then the children will continue the legacy meaning that it's it's public to the children but then it's private to people who are not the children or who are not the descendants of that right and then private private means that you oh you only you have access to it right which is in this case i know it's, it's going to be a weird example but then in this case think of it in terms of your own body no one has access to your own body only you have access to your own body it's private to you right it's private to you or for example a car a car that's that's why i don't like using a car because it doesn't really demonstrate but then still kind of demonstrates so remember with the car, right? Like uh, they say an A45, right? Mercedes Benz A45. Well, you go to buy that car. You don't, you, you, no, it's not like the whole community signed the, those pieces of papers to say, yeah, it's our car. Only one person, not even your family members have to sign that. They can sign that. It's only supposed to, sign, to be signed by one person because it's a private car. It's called a private car for a reason. Public, you can also think of it in terms of the bus, like the star bus. Isn't it accessible to the public? Okay, I know it's technically, I know students, they like to complicate things and that's why you're going to fail. Don't complicate things. Don't be like, well, public, it's only for UJ students. Well, yeah, it's only for UJ students. You can view, view in this example, view the UJ students as the public. It doesn't say if it was private or, or if it was protected, right? You would say maybe, for example, only the fac the, the students of the Faculty of Science have access to Starbucks. That's when we can say, okay, maybe it's somewhat protected or maybe private. 
or if that example doesn't ring a bell or doesn't switch on the lights in your brain, think of it in terms of it takes everyone, every Tom and Dick has access to that bus. So that's what I would say it's public. And hence it's called public transport, meaning that the, the, the public has access to that means of transportation. 2.1, so 2.1, let's see, what did they say? They said this variable underscore age must be directly accessible by all classes within the inheritance hierarchy. You see, within the animal hierarchy, by animal hierarchy, they mean inheritance. They mean only the descendants should have access to it. So, which means that the only plausible access modifier that I can use is protected. So protected underscore age as, I think this, they did, did they say the type here yeah, as integer. You need to pay attention as integer. So I think the two marks here will come from the one mark for protected, one mark for integer. So you need to be very careful when you're answering these questions. 2.2, .2, we have provide an appropriate property method for the instance variable underscore age. An appropriate, right? It means that it's either, remember for property methods, if you're watching my videos, this shouldn't be a surprise, right? This just should be revision. This shouldn't be new information. So you can have a private a property method that is read only, meaning that the, the, the property is used for accessing purposes only, for accessing only. And then for, hence, learn to, to, read, to, to read in between the lines, right? Read only, it means it's only meant to be read, only meant to be read, meaning it's only meant to be accessed. And then write only, it's the property is used to write only, meaning to change. You cannot read after changing, but then you can change. If you use the write only, you can only change. It's in the name. Try to try to to to, to read in between the lines. Don't don't be fooled by something so simple. Informatics is easy. Compared to things like C, informatics is very easy. You just don't have the ability to pick up or read between the lines. Read between the lines. It's called read only. It means it's only meant to be read. Write only. It's only meant to be, uh, to, 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 it's only meant to have write privileges, meaning that you can only write. You cannot read. Then the third one is when you have both. That's when you just only use the property keyword. That's when it has both abilities both read and write so when you, when you don't when you don't pass the word write only or read only it means it has both and when you use read only right the read only it's this is when you have the get statement right it's called the get statement and then the write only that's when you have the set statement and then the property when you have both that's when you have both right that means you have get and set statement yeah this 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 semester test one it should be a breeze you should you should you guys should get total 100 maybe the only thing that can be confused is the general knowledge questions if they did do, do include them if they don't i don't see why you wouldn't get 100 provide an appropriate property method for the instance underscore age, right? So remember, we use underscores. Basically, they, so that means if you got this part wrong, yeah, especially if, let's say you got the type wrong and this wrong, you're also gonna get question two wrong, 2.2 2 wrong. So yeah, you need to really understand what you're doing. So remember, we use underscore, the underscores to distinguish, to, to help us remember that that variable belongs to the class, it's part of the class. And then any parameters that we pass or any property methods that we pass, we, we remove the, or that we create, we remove the underscore so that it can tell the, the, the 
the, the differences between the two. So now when I create the property method, it should be called age. Let me see what did they say. If Remember, if they don't tell you whether it should only be red or it should only be red or it should only be, they could either say it should only be accessed or retrieved. Remember, it's, it's, it's still all of them are synonyms of one thing. Access, read, retrieve, it's the same thing. Or it's meant to be to be mutated or changed or, or, or written only. All of those things, they mean it's right only. Or they, they just don't say anything. If they don't say anything, that means you should have both. Yeah, that's that's my take on that. You should just have both. Because they didn't tell you. They said just say create um an appropriate method, property method for underscore age. Because if you only if you only set it to to access, right? What if it uh, you're also supposed to mutate? You see, it becomes a problem. What if you only put in a set statement, meaning meaning you want to change the variable only, but it cannot be read. But what if it actually or it was actually supposed to be read too? So you see, it becomes a, a, a tricky situation. So I, I would advise you just use you use use both. You create the proper method that is both the get and set statement. Basically, me it means that omit right, omit writing that write only keyword and omit writing the read only keyword. So they say note that any input must be validated to ensure that they are not negative. So that means before we set the values, we need to check if they're not negative. How do we do that? It's a simple statement. So I'm going to define the property method here. I'm going to say um, public property. Remember, when you, use, when you say property without any write only or read only, it means that it has both capabilities. So write only, proper, public property, right? Um, uh, age, that's going to be its name. And then don't forget the brackets to, so that it, it knows that this is a property method as integer remember it needs, the type needs to match with the data type of that age or that um that instance that the the, the variable inside of a class the data types need to match and then i'm gonna remember you always start with the get statement and then you have end get here and then you're gonna have a return statement here you're gonna return underscore age Right. But then before you return underscore age, you need to check. So I actually need to create what I call a helper function. Because I can't, you see, it's going to be, I'm going to repeat myself because I'm going to do an if statement here. Do if underscore age is less than zero. Yeah, I don't want to do that. I'll create a helper method for that. We also have set, right, which takes in a value from the user. And it needs to be the same value as the data type of age. I can't set, I can't take in a string to set an, an integer. It makes no sense. So value as integer. And then end set. And then I'm going to say underscore age is equals to that value from the user. But then before I set the value and before I return the value, okay, returning the value is not a problem. I feel like the main problem is here. Yeah. It, um, so I'm starting to think about it. When they say that you should make sure that the values are, are not negative, because remember, the values need to be initialized first. How do they get initialized? You write to them, right? No pun intended. You write to them, right? So you're going to take in some value from the user. This value needs to be validated first. So it's simple. It's a simple if statement, right? They said it should be non not negative. That means you can set it to any value. Remember negative, it means it's below zero. So that means it should actually be, in terms of C++, that means it should be unsigned, meaning positive from zero to infinity. So that means if it's, I'll do an if statement before setting the value, I'll do an if statement. So I'll say, if my value happens to be less than zero, then that means it's negative, right? And then I'm gonna need to end the if statement. That means that I'm going to need to update that value and set it to zero because I don't want to have my age to be, to be, um, I, okay. I, there's many ways you can go about doing this, right? This is the first approach before setting the value. I can change the value, this value and make sure that it's not less than zero, meaning that it's not negative. 
remember this statement, this part, right, this Boolean condition, it only executes if the condition is true, meaning that if value is indeed negative, then we should update it. If it's not, it's just going to skip this if statement and then set the age to, add to whatever value that is, because that means the value is greater, is greater than or equals to zero, meaning that it's from zero to infinity. So this is the full property method that they wanted for 2.2. Like I said, there's many ways to kill a cat to do all that. There is a second way you can write this. I don't care whatever way you write it, just make sure it makes sense. You could say if value is less than underscore is less than zero, then I'll just set the age to zero. Because at the end of the day, age will be set to value. Then I can do an else and say else. Meaning that if that part is false, that means it's, it's not negative, then just set the value as usual. So it's up to you. This is the second approach. It's up to you in whatever approach you want to take. So I'll just leave the second approach. So 2.3. So 2.3, we are. OK, there's quite a lot. Let me see how much time have I spent here. Yeah, it's, it's a, almost an hour, but then it's it's I'll try. I'm sure it's going to be roughly around one hour, 30 minutes, which is not too bad, which is not too long. So let's see, provide a function that will return the type of blood or oh, no the type of food. Um, yeah, yeah, the thing of being on the computer too much, you, you tend to lose a bit of your eyesight. Provide a function that will return the type of food. I advise you guys to get classes, talk to your parents, especially if you're a computer science major. Your eyes, it's going to affect your eyesight. Computers affect your eyesight. Too much screen time affects your eyesight. Go talk to your parents, get your eyes checked. I think in Dorf um, your you can get everything and the glasses. Your, 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 they check your eyesight, your eyes, and everything, and, and including the glasses. It's like 1.5. Yeah, somewhere there. So you can talk to your parents because, yeah, it's going to affect your eyesight. So we have this. They say that provide a function, right? So we need to create a function that will return the type of food an animal can eat based on the diet type. So they, you might ask yourself, what I don't know, what is the what is the type of food? What data type should I use? I don't know. Well, if you read continuously, you see they they they're giving you a hint. See table below for values. They see they told you see the table below for values. Remember that type. We know what data type is. What data type? What data type is? It is. It's an integer. The main thing we're worried about is what that was the data type of type of food. As you can see, it's in double quotes. Remember anything in programming that's in double quotes, it's a string. So we know the function should return a string. They said return. Pay attention to the English being used here. Students didn't take me serious. They're like, ah, you, 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 English doesn't really matter. It does matter. Look, you, if you didn't see this part, you'd be like, you, you continue your code, you'll be fine, but then you won't get full marks. That's what separates students from who get 100 and students who get 80 something percent. It's just following instructions and understanding the English. So we need to create a function that returns the type of food. So it should return a type of food. So basically, even the name should be somewhat similar. To, and remember, this function should return, right? And remember, functions always make them public. They, they also want to see the access modifier that you use. Remember, if a function is private, it's called a helper or utility method, meaning that it's not meant to be accessed by the public. It's just meant to help me with my code so that I don't repeat myself. So private function, uh, I'm going to call it get type of food. Right? They didn't tell you about parameter. They didn't discuss. Remember, the data type they're supposed to re return is this thing. If they told you it should take in a parameter of type they would have told you do not answer your own questions please do not answer your own questions and it doesn't need a, a, a parameter either way why because diet type is part of this class so i can check within that the variable i already have the variable within the class 
And remember, the name is called underscore data type. So when you're doing the if statement, it needs to be like that. So they said data type. If the value is zero, they should be there. Answer. So for me, I'll make it simple. I'll use a st if statement and then return that actual string. So what do I mean? I'll do it like this. I'll say that this, you see, there's many ways to solve this, right? That's why I'm saying that I'll do it in my own way. There's many ways. For example, you could use the name of the function as a, as a local variable. Why, why, why is that allowed? Because it's allowed because if I look at, if I do this, I remove the round brackets and I remove this. Doesn't the, just read only this, this line starting from public up until string. Doesn't this look like a variable? Yes, it does. So therefore you can use the name, you can treat the function name as a variable. So I'll copy this function name and do this and initialize it to an empty string, right? This is just initializing it to an empty string. It's like taking an, an, an integer data uh, the variable, right? And initializing it to zero before I calculate the sum. It's taking it's basically the same thing. So now I'm going to check if underscore diet type diet type is equals to zero, then I'm going to have an end if, right? So the way I will solve it, right? I'm going to have multiple, I'm going to have else ifs, else if statements. Because why am I having else if? Remember, if you have multiple if statement, it means that all three can be true simultaneously. That's not the case. It has to be one of them. So therefore, I'm going to use an, an, an else if statement because it can only be one of them that that is that supposed to be true. So if it is equals to zero, that means they get the type of food, right? Which is that variable that I'm going to use, which is the function name. They said we should say it's plant-based foods. Plant-based foods. So it's going to be plant-based foods. That's, that should be the type. And then else if underscore diet type is equals to one, then get type of food should be equal to, should be equal to what? Let me go back here, should be equal to meat. Okay, this is now meat. And make sure you have even the capitalization, everything needs to match. That's why I'm just copying and pasting from the question papers because I don't want to miss the capitalization in the right places. You they they are they they are lenient, right? But then some people might not be as lenient in the future. For example, when you're doing like final year and things like that, if you don't follow the right thing, they might not be that lenient. So just practice practice being a perfectionist right now. It's too early. And then. So that you create a, you form a habit, a good habit. So now remember I've, I've, I've stored, I've got in the, all the values. Now I can just return the data type, which is just the function name. Because like, remember what I said, the function name can act as a variable as you, as you saw that it technically kind of looks like a variable. So I just return the type of food, which is basically the, the function name. Or you could do this. Right, there's remember there's multiple ways. Or you could do this. I, I prefer this method that I just did right now. Or you could just do this. You just totally remove everything and just return the strings as they are. What do I mean? So you just say return. Because this function is supposed to return a string. So I can just literally return the string. And then when I get here, I can just return the meat. So that's why sometimes lecturers don't understand why, how come student's code is, is the same. It shouldn't be the same because you see this, this is a second way of doing it. And it all, both methods lead to the right answer. They are correct. So you shouldn't be doing the same thing. Everyone shouldn't do the same thing. It should be, it should be unique. Or I could do this if I was, you see, there's many ways of solving this. I could say DM um, food. I can use the local variable as string. I can do that. There's many ways of solving this question. I'll just stick to this one so that you get familiar of the capabilities of uh, Visual Basic. That you can, you can use the function name as, as sort of like a local variable within that function. And then I'm going to go to 2.4. 
and then 2.4 so that means you're done that's you get your full six marks then and then 2.4 they say define a construct remember if you go back at the top they said visual basic code not uml so they want the code the, the actual so you'd actually that's why it's important to do your practicals if you did your practicals you'd know that to declare a constructor you say public sub new and remember um, um what i always say a class is a template or a plan to build the thing for example a plan to build a house obviously the house is going to need builders so those builders are called constructors in programming so constructors are actually the builders which help us build the object or the thing that we've, we've planned to build so they say define a construct right so i already know i need to define a constructor so i'm going to have public sub new and then end sub routine right and then what parameter should it take they said three parameters that will create an instance of pet shop right and ensure that the animal array is correctly set in memory that means you have redeemed you know read that you've used the redeem keyword that's what they mean there so if i go back up you want three parameters which makes sense i need to take in the name and the contact and the size of the array because they said i should resize the array right so it only makes sense to do so so i need to take in the name and remember we used underscores in the to declare the the instance variables right or the variables within the class so that the computer knows that these variables are within my class and then when you create parameters right we can reuse the same names without the underscore it will tell it will tell the difference it will know the difference because remember every time you create a variable or parameter it needs to have meaning you can't just say n as in as string what do you mean by n so you need to write it in full and say name as string and then remember in visual basic you can say comma space and then underscore and then press enter and when you press enter it's going to align and move to that same line so i'm just putting there out of habit and then i'm going to need to take in the, the number of animals right i will write it in full number of animals you could say n n animals but then don't forget to put the comment you need to put a comment on the side to say this is the number of animals. So to make to avoid that, I just wrote it in full so that even the user who, who even the person who doesn't know how to code when they read this, they can read oh number of animals. And then comma underscore. Yeah, it will do this in Visual Basic. When you put that underscore and then you press enter to move on to the next line and to align everything automatically. And then the last thing is the contact contact as a string is it string or an integer let me just double check yeah it's a string remember we we don't pass arrays as parameters functions as parameters to functions we've never done that you are you only pass in the size because you're going to need that size i keep forgetting that um visual basic it does this thing of like you have to capitalize the first letter of each variable. It's unlike languages like C++ and Java, where we actually use the lowercase for the first for the first letter of the variable. So I have this. Obviously, all they need me to do is initialize. So that means underscore name is equals to that name that I'm taking from the constructor, and then underscore contact is equals to the contact that I'm taking in from the user via the constructor. And then I need to redeem, that's the last step. Remember they said, make sure that the array is properly allocated. So redeem underscore animals array to be the size of that parameter number of animals. So what, ha what would happen if you decided to remove the underscore, All right? Let me teach you some, some let me give you some free advice. If you didn't have underscore, right? Let's say you just call it literally called it name. That's why we use the underscore so that it can know the difference. If you wrote it like this, right? If it was name name, it will get confused which one, which name is the one inside of my class and which name is the one that I'm taking in as a parameter. 
there's this keyword called me. So when you say me and you say dot followed by the 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 whether the function or it's the variable within that class, you don't know. Oh, you mean me, my name, right? My name, right? And then this other name, oh, that's the other parameter because I now know this me means the name inside of my class. So you can use the me keyword. For those doing C++, the me is the same as this. It's the same as doing this in C++. When you say this name is the cost name for those doing C++. But then if you're doing informatics, you're 100% of the time doing computer science, which is C++. So yeah, you should find similarities in this. This is what it means. Remember in C++, we make use of pointers in languages like Visual Basics and Java, pointers are managed for us under the hood. So you could do it like this. Nothing's also stopping you from doing it like this. Like you're still using the me and the underscore. It's still fine. If you want to flex that you know your code, it's still fine. But then I'll just leave it like this because they already use the underscore. This So that means I can omit or I don't have to always remember to use that me keyword. And then this is where we resize the array as as the question required us to do so if you scroll down they said the array is correctly set in memory and then they said provide a prop a, a, an appropriate property method that will ensure that the name of the pet shop cannot be changed right outside the class itself it is people are trick remember we we want the property method right remember the keyword is appropriate meaning the right one that means you won't get three marks if you declare the, the wrong property method. You might get half or even one mark because you, there's a lot of things that will be missing. Basically, you, you are, it's a wrong answer. It's a right answer to the wrong question. Provide an appropriate property method that will ensure that the name of the pet shop cannot be changed outside the class itself. So that means it cannot be changed when you go outside, but then they still want the property method. What does that mean? It means that they want you to be able to read it, but you cannot write. So that it means that they want it to be read only. That's what they want. So let's make that property method. So public read only property for name. So it's, I'm gonna call it name. And then I put those brackets there to show that this is a property method. Remember the term property, let me see if they call it, yeah. Property method, meaning function. Keep that in mind. So functions, remember they always have brackets like this. If, even if it doesn't have any parameters, it has, always has brackets. And property. And then remember read only property means that you can only read, meaning that you can only get, but you cannot change, which is exactly what we are doing here because they said it cannot be changed outside the class. That means you can set it with the constructor, right? Remember the constructor that is to help us build the object. We're setting it because it's private by default, right? So we need to, it needs to have some value. That's the point that I'm trying to make. It needs to have some value of which the constructor will handle that part. But then after it has the value, it cannot be changed. But then they still want to read a, a property method. That means that that can only conclude to one thing. It means the property should be read only, since they said it shouldn't be changed. So remember, read only. It has a get the get statement. Remember the notes that I made at the top. Um, where are the notes? Yeah. So the read only it has the get statement, meaning that get blah 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 return. That's what I mean by that. And then end get. And you should only be able to get, meaning that I can just only return underscore. Don't forget the underscore. This is the property name. If you say return name, it's like you're trying, now you're trying to do something very spiritual. Like you're trying to do recursion on a property method because yeah, it's, remember it's, a, it's called a property method or a function. When you do this, you're technically trying to call the function within the function itself, which is very spiritual. You've never done a property method that calls itself. Don't be spiritual. Put the underscore. And then I think we're done with the two point with question two. 
Then now we get to the year amount, which is the last question. So with the year amount, it looks it looks it looks cute. So I'll open D right so that we can do the year amount. So consider a base class called gaming, right? That means we have a base class called gaming, right? Or you can I'll say I'll actually say I'll actually advise them to call it game with because the uh, remember the the inheritance right it, it showcases and is a relationship that's why i'm saying i would I'd advise them to call it something else okay question three is going to be year more so okay for question three i'll just write here so remember our if we have a base class called game and then we have let's say we have fortnite right that's a game so we would say that fortnite is a game but then if they call it gaming it's like they're saying fortnite is a gaming you get what i'm saying i don't see why they would have named it like that they should have named it game fortnite is a game so game would be the base abstract or the base class or the abstract base class but then it would be some base class and it would make sense but then it's fine that's how they did it so we're just gonna stick to that remember the main important thing is not to answer your own questions. Do not do not try to show them that you know more than what is required. Don't try to fix the questions to wrong you, even though you are right. So just go with even if they made a mistake, just go with that mistake. Unless if they state it in the in the venue, they tell you no. Yeah, I had made a mistake. The the class should actually be called game, not gaming. If they didn't say so, just use the same name. So I have abstract. I have a base class. Or, I keep thinking abstract because I was teaching visual functions yesterday, pure visual functions. Um, it's a base class, right, called gaming. So I'm going to open here and then select that class, tap to paste it there. And then the base class will be called gaming. And then they haven't told, told us what, what are the attributes or the variables and the operations or the methods. So define the gaming class. It must have at least two attributes and one appropriate method. They say construct and property methods do not count. When they say do not count, they mean do not write them. Stop wasting time. Students like wasting time. I don't know why. Do not write them. They won't be marked. There's zero. You get zero for that because there's no marks for it. But hence it's called, it's, it's written two marks because there's not a lot of things that should write there. Just create the gaming class two attributes or true two variables and one appropriate method done and then next question do the thing that you're supposed to do and then leave done don't do excel things so you this question you shouldn't have any constructors or property methods unless stated so they put it in round in brackets i remember english round brackets or brackets is just to provide extra information it's like to guide you, right? They say construct and property methods do not count, meaning don't put them. They, they couldn't care less about them. So gaming, right? In, remember, in a, a base class, whenever you have a base class, you're taking the common things between games, right? The first thing that I can notice here, we can see that there's, um, you could, technically you could say it's a what type of game that is the base class can store that. What type of game it is basically each class can can keep track of a variable that keeps track of what type of game it is that can be common amongst all of them so i can create maybe like a new attribute and call it type of game right and then the type of game would be i'll just make it a string and then if they said base class right remember they're trying to see that you can model and do UML and you know the different access access modifiers. If every time they say base class, always use protected for your variables. Because that means there'll be that means you understand that protected is used when there's inheritance. So I'm gonna make the visibility to protected, which is the hash symbol. And then the type of game, I'll just make it a string and then apply. And then um that's that's one of the things. This this is the question that I hated the most every time I, I I did when I wrote this paper. I was like, why? It gets you to think. It wants you to think and think and think. So 
we have the type of game we have this gaming um okay there's a gaming console i don't what do they mean gaming I, I, they should have chosen a different name if i'm being honest so what are what are the common things um in in all of the classes right the common things that i'm thinking of right now is each game has a specific number of characters of or game characters right like the number of angry angry birds is you can choose a character you can choose this red character or this yellow one or this black one same applies with fifa you can choose multiple teams right things like that minecraft things like that you can get what i'm saying you can choose that right so i can say new and say a uh, number of game characters right number of game i'll just make it an integer integer and then protected and then in terms of operation i'll just keep uh, in terms of operations or methods i just create a simple method and call play and then um yeah I'll just call it play and then i'll just say void then that's pretty much all i'm gonna write there. the thing um okay Gwenji, this is this is um informatics i don't you can just put play there yeah this is not compsci c plus plus so there's the gaming class right Ty, what type of game it is what are the number of game characters that game has and you can play each game it's common right remember the base class should have the common things in all of the classes this is a very bad example. They really want you to think these people. Create two additional classes that will both inherit directly from gaming. They must each have two and one. You see, that's what I don't like. It's fine. Let's choose FIFA. Um, so with FIFA, right? Since someone FIFA is also is a game, right? is not it's not is a gaming it's a game that's why i advised them to do it that way but then it's fine we're gonna work with what you have so each fifa game um you can we can say uh, goals i can store goal goals scored basically how many goals goals were scored remember this is a foot football game right or a soccer game and then by default i'll make it private they didn't talk about property methods. Remember, they said they, they do not count. They don't care. They, they couldn't care less about those. And then I'm going to add a new, uh, and then say, what am I going to say? Which team, right? Let's store which team you are using, right? Which team are you using to play the game? So team, and then I'm going to make it a string, and then private. And then the goals, the goal scored, um, yeah, that's fine, yeah. And then in terms of method, right? Basically, what are the things you can do in FIFA? You can you can uh, move player. Yeah, you can move player. That's okay. That's common. You see, I'm starting. I'm starting to get a bit of a uh, little bit of ideas here for the. Base abstract base class, you can in each game you can be able to move the player. So you can have a method that's called move player. You can do that. So I think that's actually a better example. So let me go to operations and change it to move player. So move player, then apply, then okay. Yeah, I think that's a better example to say move player. And then in FIFA. Let me let's think. Um, you can. All I'm thinking about is scoring and whatnot. You can also say um, store the goalkeeper. What type of goalkeeper is there? What's his name? Things like that. There's many. There's many things you can think of. And when you're thinking of these things, right? When you come up with variables, always think of. They're called variables or attributes. Always think of nouns, right? And then when you think of methods or functions, 
think of verbs, right? Action, right? Like move player, that's an action. And then number of players, that's a noun. I'm naming something, right? This this represents number of players. I'm naming something. And then um, the thing is, I'm not quite familiar with all the other games. FIFA is some, something that I'm a bit familiar with. So we can have, um, I can calculate, let me see. Yeah, I can have, remember that you can each, each every time you score, every time you win a match, there's points, right? You get points and you become, you're at the top of the league. It places you, it gives you a position in the league, right? So I can say calculate points. Calculate, so I need to write calculate points. So what are the points that you've earned for in every single match so that you can give you a score of where, where you currently are in the where you currently are in the in the league right in the what what is that called I, I'm not a fan of soccer like that but then there's a thing called a league that there's that table which shows the number of points that each team has so I can have a function or a method that calculates those points and then we are done there. Yeah, there's a lot of, okay, this one is not too bad, but then still thinking. That's not something that I'm very fond of. When when you have a, such an open-ended question and they give you an example that you're not really familiar with. So, um, yeah, I could choose, I could choose PlayStation, right? But then, the PlayStation is for or Xbox, it's for the composition part. We'll deal with the composition part. So for the games, we can only choose Angry Birds, Minecraft, or Candy Crush. Um, for Candy Crush, we could store, let me see. I think we can create can Candy Crush. Candy Crush, we could store like maybe the level, right? And the fruits that have been agree crushing, yeah. I, I'm kind of coming up with something here. Yeah. So Candy Crush, we could for Candy Crush, I'm gonna make it simple. We could keep track of the level, what level the user is currently at. Remember, you can also put you could maybe choose if you know more information about Candy Crush, you could maybe put the level inside the FIFA class, like the level of difficulty is it medium uh, is it medium or hard or easy or professional things like that you could put the level so me i'll put the level in candy crush because i'm not that familiar with it and then i'll also keep track of what is this number of candies crushed number of candies crushed it does keep track yeah it's sort of like points in a way but then i phrase it to, I've, I've phrased the variable to relate to the class. It's candy crush, so I'm crushing candies. So I can also keep track of the number of candies that I've crushed. So integer, then private, and then operation. That's where the tricky part comes now. One more operation and then we are done. Then we'll be left with composition and then we'll be done. So what, crush the candy, yeah. That's the function. Yeah, I know it's it's like it's a it's a very mundane thing. But then I'm just gonna say crash candy because I, I it's it's a it's a task, right? You're crashing the candy. So crash candy. Make my life simple. That's what I don't like about that question. It'll get you thinking. And then generalization or inheritance. Remember that um triangle is always there, it's pointing to the base class. Then goes down there. There we go. So we are done. Finally, felt I felt like hell. Having to come up with these things, it's annoying. Using one of the derived classes, demonstrate composition. Right. Using one of the derived classes, one of them, the component class must have. Um. Composition, 
the component class, meaning that class that has the, 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 the derived class, right? Basically what they're trying to say, when they say component class, they're saying the class that has the other class. That's what it means, or that has the class that has the other object. So what they're saying is use one of these classes, whether so FIFA or Angry Birds, and make that class to be composed or to be inside of another class. So which class I can choose here? There's this thing called gaming consoles, where each of the gaming consoles has a game. So that's why they put it, they put their um, PS5 or PS4, I think that's PS4, PS3. Gaming consoles have or has a game. So gaming console can have FIFA, it can have Fortnite, it can have, get what I'm saying? So you choose one. Either way, they are the same because they have a game. So let me see. They said the using one of the derived classes demonstrate composition. The component class must consist of two attributes and one method. Constructor and property methods do not count. So by default, we already have one variable, which is an instance of the of the other class, right? So we can already use that to our own advantage. So I can do this and then double click. And then this would be, which one should I choose? Let me choose Xbox. They say this shows the Xbox. One of the attributes is that I'm going to say Candy Crush, right? I'm, you don't have to use any, you don't have to use, okay, you see now I'm making a mistake. Sorry for that. I've totally made a mistake. I forgot to put the underscores for the variables, for each of the variables, so that it knows that that variable belongs to the class. Don't forget to put your underscores. So now I need to go back and refix. And remember, you'll be using a piece of paper, not a computer, so you can't afford to make that mistake. Or else you're going to be using a lot of paper. Uh, underscore level. Underscore level apply. And then underscore number of candies crushed. And then that's it. And then I'm going to go back here to my Xbox class. It's going to have an instance, right? It could be either the Candy Crush instance or FIFA instance. I'll use Candy Crush. So I'll say, I'll call it underscore candy. There's a remember need to demonstrate composition. So that means by default, you have one free variable. The one that's composed or that's the instance that's um, within the other class. So this will be a uh, candy crush data type. That's where we demonstrate the composition. So apply. Did I call the candy crush class candy crush? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, that's right. And then each of this. Yeah, yeah, that's so this, this is. Um, so it, 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 it was a good idea to change this to move player. Each 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 um each game has a capability or ability to move players. Remember what I what I talked about. Now I have an operation that I can use. Remember the could these gaming consoles they allow you to play games. So I'm gonna create a method called play game. Simple. So I can play the game using this console. So play game. Now I'm left with one variable. And then we are done. What else can I put here for each gaming console? Because they said you need to have at least two attributes, meaning two variables. And then the five marks will just correct YAML notation. And then let me see. Mm. Okay, so let me see. Oh, da, 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 da. A gaming console. The gaming console. I could be generic, right? It's up to you. I could be very basic and say store the name of that gaming console. 
like okay let's just say okay let's let's let me let me be lazy but i don't know what to put honestly i don't know what can you put for a gaming console other than the fact that you can the only i can only have a method that allows me to play the game because you can play the game with that and then ah uh, let me see yeah i'll just make it playstation right i'll change the class to playstation why am i changing it to playstation i don't know i know there's xbox 360 xbox what what but then playstation is easier so playstation you can have the name or the name right the name of the playstation meaning is it playstation 4 playstation 5 playstation 3 you get what I'm saying? So that's why I'm saying I'm going to be lazy on that and create play not the, the name of the PlayStation and then apply. And then remember, this class is now composed in there. So I must do, do aggregation, but then it's not actually going to be aggregation. It's going to be composition. This is where now you need to decide. It, will this be demonstrating composition? Does it demonstrate composition or aggregation? Remember, there's five marks for write notation, UMO notation. They, will, they wouldn't care necessarily about whether you use a creation or whatnot, because it's like so, sort of like an open-ended question. So it is, technically it is a creation because the gaming console can exist on its own, right? Without a game. But then I don't think so, because if if we didn't have games then there wouldn't be a need for gaming consoles so that means if the games didn't exist the gaming consoles also wouldn't exist so therefore that's composition so in this case we actually had to make it composition so composition and then apply and then a candy crash is composed or is inside of this playstation class so this would be the uml and then you would get your full marks, which is 15 marks. So that's it for the session and good luck with your semester test one.